Let me pray and ask God to come, please. Come, and we'll start. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. We come to you in the name of Jesus, and I'm grateful. I'm really grateful that um, I could say strawberry and banana, and if the Holy Spirit wanted to come, that we would, we would all hear what we need to hear. That's the way you work. So, Holy Spirit, I just give you permission to, to come and tell us what the Father wants you to tell us, and that our hearts would be changed, that the calluses on us would be broken up, that the hard places would be stirred up, and you would add that fertilizer around our roots, and, and we would begin to see growth. We would begin to understand um, that maybe we're in a season right now. Miss Helen used to say, you can't tie blossoms on your tree. That there are times where we're in a, a, we lie fallow, and, uh, but then there comes the time where the fruit comes. And so we are grateful for that. So tonight as we read your word, Father, Jesus, as we read your words in red, I pray that we'll be encouraged and we'll be stirred. And I'm grateful that you are our Savior and our Lord. And I ask all this in the name of Jesus, grateful for another opportunity to speak well of your name. Amen. Well, let's turn to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. Uh, we talked, maybe referred to the widow's gift um, in a previous study. Um, thank you for praying for me as I teach. Um, on Mondays, I was just telling some people, on Mondays I have about five hours that I teach. From four until nine. Uh, kids who don't really know how to write. And um, they're in a lab and then they're in the first semester of freshman English composition and at my college we do argumentative essays because basically everything you do is an argument in the, the formal term of you have an opinion you want to back up your opinion up you want to acknowledge someone else's opinion and just try to maybe at the end of it have you say I see what you're saying there's some points I'm not may not agree with you but you've presented it well that's what we try to do and um <laughs> it is such a picture of how we all do life, uh, the, the, the different kids. You know, you've got one in the back, doesn't say a thing, you know, kind of hunkered down behind the monitor. I mean, I have to, like, go sit up a little bit. Let me see you. What are you doing back there? So I have to walk in between the computers, you know, to see what everybody's up to. And then I'm like, where's your book? Well, I didn't bring it. Uh, well, this is the night you need it. Uh, isn't that funny? This is the class you bought it for, and uh, we'll, we're going to be looking at it tonight. And um, Okay. Where's your book? I haven't bought it yet. I work two jobs. Okay. I don't know how to help you. Maybe give you 30 bucks. I don't know what to do. Um, but he's like, no, no, I can do it. And I have a kid who previously said, uh, you know, I really shouldn't be in here because I really know how to write. I just don't test well. So, you know, I really know what I'm doing. I'm like, cool, I, that's great, I understand that. Um, you know, it's just a semester long. I have another kid go, this is just a semester? You mean it doesn't go the whole year? No, sweetheart, college has semesters. Wow! <laughs> I mean, so I've just, got, I've just got the gamut. I'm like, boy, he's really excited that he's not going to have to sit here with me for the whole year. It's like, this is like prison. I said, if you think it's prison, just think what I think it is. <laughs> I keep saying the same thing over and over 50 different ways and, and you still stare at me like are you speaking English you know and anyway this kid so we put up his essay first last night and what I did was I put it on a big screen like this at the front of the room and I said okay let's start reading this essay okay it flashes up I said what's the first problem there's no title <laughs> you're supposed to have a title oh yeah I forgot oh yeah I guess so Okay, this is the one who knows what he's doing, right? Shouldn't be in there. I said, uh, <laughs> after his intro paragraph, this is my question. What is your topic? I don't even know what you're writing about. He went, oh, okay, well, it made sense up here. I went, well, you know what you have to do with uh, a writing? It has to make sense here, not just here. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. We go through half his essay and he's not doing anything but just looking up. And I said, do you think you should take some notes? Oh, yeah, notes. Uh, and I'm just like, 
isn't that like it sometimes God really tries to say things to us and hey, we don't need to be in this place because, you know, I know what I'm doing. I don't know why I'm in this dummy class. Um, I don't know why God keeps testing me because I know what I'm doing. And then, you know, you get to a point and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I really don't know what I'm doing. But then you act like you know what you're doing because everybody else looks like they know what they're doing. And I brought in this little um, toy wagon that's like an, from an old set that used to have a tractor. And it's, a, you know, just a metal wagon from maybe the 50s. And so I say to him, I said, now, this is your essay. There have four wheels. I said, this is your intro paragraph on this wheel. I said, this is your body paragraph. This is your refutation or rebuttal. And this is your conclusion. I said, your wagon doesn't roll if you don't have it all. Okay? And then I put it down and I filled it up with candy. And I said, and then when your essay rolls, your reader gets a sweet treat. Walked around the room. Hey, Dr. C. Thanks. Appreciate it, Dr. C. Oh, let me, hmm, let's see what I, see. I'm like, it's free. Pick one. I mean, the wagon's this big. I mean, how far do you have to look? <laughs> so they get that. So they're coming. They come to the front. About 8.30, I'm like, oh, my God. This one kid's been staring at his computer screen. And I'm like, okay. We've already determined after reading your essay, you don't know what you're talking about. Okay? So you have research. Start writing. Just write. Start writing what it is. I just can't get my head wrapped around this. Well, try wrapping it around your fingers. Your fingers need to type. You type stuff like falls out of your head. It, 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 like it happens. I, I just, I, when I type, I really don't want to mess it up. <laughs> and I'm like, you think you type once? You just write it once and it's supposed to be okay? See, we have to realize that life is one of those messy things that we just keep working at. Some of us do better with some things. Some of us don't. Some of us are just we're beating our head against the wall. Uh, sometimes we're just so tired or we're with people and it's like, why don't you get it? You ever, you ever felt like that? Like, why are you not getting this? And one day I asked the Lord uh, about my dad. I said, why does dad not understand this? And quick as a wink, he said, you never need to ask again why your dad doesn't get this. You need to ask why you did. Why were your eyes open? How is it that you see some of these things? So don't be looking around and asking me, you know, like, why are this not happening? Or why are they not coming along faster? Or even for yourself, like, why am I not getting this faster? Because you can only go as fast as you can go. Have you noticed that? That's not, like, really big wisdom. They're not going to put that up on a bill. Roseanne Coleman, you can only go as fast as you can go. Wow, let's put her on the Today Show. They're, they're not going to do that. But it's like you can only do the next right thing. So when you're writing, <laughs> I have another kid, he's like, well, I had another English doctorate read this paper, and he found nothing wrong with it. I said, well, don't tell him you don't have a thesis statement. <laughs> And all the way through the class, he's writing, and he look at me like, he thought it was fine. He's just writing and writing. Like, I'm, I'm punishing him. Like, this other guy was okay. Why didn't I take his word for it? And I'm like, you don't have a thesis statement. There's no guiding sentence in your essay to tell you where you're going. So my first question tonight is, is do you have a thesis statement in your life? Do you know where you're going do you know what you're doing? Do you know how, do you have some things that you say, you know what, I want to, I have some goals. I want to have some goals here. And, and these goals have to have evidence underneath them. Could be your health. It could be a relationship. It could be time in the word. It could be being more observant. Um, you know, something that you actually put out in front of yourself, because if you don't set any goals, you, you'll surely get there. I mean, you, you won't have anywhere to go. You have to say, these are the things I want to try to think about. And sometimes I have to say, just keep your eyes on the Lord and don't cuss out loud. Don't, don't cuss out loud. Um, and I, I use that a lot to be funny, but sometimes, you know, your brain just swells up inside your head and you're just like, I can't think of another thing to say. I can't think of another thing to teach. I can't think of another way to say it. And so I just look at them and say, I'm going to pray for you. And they're like, thanks. I'm like, you don't even know what that means. That means I am finished. I don't 
that. And the Lord said, well, you should have been praying all along. Well, I have been praying, but I get to a point of exhaustion. That's my second point. Sometimes when you're working in your life, when you get really tired, you just need to rest. You just need to rest. You need to quit running around. You need to say to people, I'd love to come. I know maybe I've been in charge for 10 years, but today I've got to rest. Today I can't go. Today something is telling me to stay at my house. And you know what? For so long, I never said no. And I remember I had said it was a church. One more, I had said yes to one more thing. And I was about two weeks into it. And I was spending time with the Lord just like lamenting. Like, what can I do? And he said, you got to quit that. I'm like, I can't quit in the middle of it. I can't quit now. I have to get finished. Right? You know what I'm saying? And then not sign up again. And he said, nope, you need to quit right now. Don't you love it when God gives you like that thing where you're going to be obedient or disobedient? And what I have found, this is what God says. You can go easy or you can go hard, but you're going to go my way. <laughs> Either you're going to obey me or obey me. Which, which one would you like? And so I had to say, I'm so sorry, but I have to back out of this. And the lady just absolutely, you Southerners know this, pitched a hissy fit. I mean a hissy fit. I mean, she was just like, well, why can't you wait, you know, another eight weeks and we'll be finished with this. And I'm like, well, I can't because I shouldn't have said yes in the first place. It's my sin. It's my, it's my bad. I have to take it, but I cannot change my answer I'm just sorry well she never trusted me again so I go back to the Lord and I said she'll never trust me again he says it's really inconsequential in this moment because it was are you going to be obedient or are you going to be disobedient see sometimes I am so focused on what you're going to think about me that I don't listen for those little things where God might say I want you to be obedient when I began to walk with the Lord, and that was back in 1978 or 79, I'd been a Baptist kid all my life. I mean, I'd been in church, but I, I didn't really, when people talk about hearing from God, I didn't really know what they were talking about. You know, I'd seen, you know, healing people on television. We watched Ernest Angley, and we watched, um, what was that, Oral Roberts. I, mean, I remember on the little black and white, I'd get ready early so I could watch Oral Roberts heal people because, you know, I'm like, we didn't do that at my church. And then, you know, we weren't really sure if he was doing that there or not, but it was just certainly something to watch. So then I would turn off the healing service and go to order of worship at my Baptist church. And so when I began to, to study the word and I began to see a difference in some people's lives to where it really was a living, breathing reality that they read the word, they followed the word, they talked with God, they journaled, they seemed to have this conversation with God. My com Now, I don't know about y'all, but I have a constant, I bet you don't believe this, I have a constant conversation in my head all the time. I'm sure y'all don't believe that, do you? Somebody's talking <laughs> all the time. Now, I'm not schizophrenic, I am, but somebody's talking all the time. And I found out that before I began to talk to the Lord all the time, my talk was negative. You're, so, you're an idiot. Why did you say that? Why did you wear that outfit? You're so stupid. You need to be careful. Don't do that. I mean, it was that negative, pick up a hammer, hit you in the head. My dad used to be very negative to me. And I think I've said to you before, when I moved out and I realized I was hitting myself in the had it. I just picked it up and started doing it myself. He, he quit. He was somewhere else, and I started doing it because I was so used to being a failure. And God said, you need to put down that hammer. Talk to me. So when I began to train myself to talk to the Lord, I didn't have that negative talk because when you're talking with him, he's going to say, you're my beloved. Yes, you messed up, but now you have a new chance. Now let think, think upon me. Look to me. Ask me if you should go to that. Ask me if you, you should. And I'm like, you can do that? And he, I, he began to train me a little at a time. And I sort of used to think that I'm asking God to make a decision. I, I needed to know a decision. And I remember one time I was talking to Miss Helen about making this decision. And I'm like, I, I need to learn how to, how to make a decision and hear God. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you do that? And she said, well, roll. When you're trying to make a decision, if it doesn't give you a yes, then it's a no. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's exactly what she... 
And I'm like, really? She said, yes. I said, okay. So immediately I had to go to where I lived with, with other girls in a house, and we were trying to, to vote on a, a roommate. And I get there, and I interview her, or she interviews me. And she's like, hey, what you think? And I'm like, well, I have to say no. Why? Because I don't have a yes. <laughs> I don't have a yes. I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm trying to learn how to hear the Lord. Um, she never spoke to me again. But all I knew was I was trying to learn how to hear the Lord. I moved here. And one night, I was about to go out uh, the door, and I, was, I went every Tuesday to a, a bakery place, and they gave us their end-of-day bakery things, loaves of bread and sweets and stuff like that. We'd load them up in bags, and I would come, and I would pick up a lady over in Franklin, here in Franklin, and we would go into the projects downtown Franklin. And she and I would stop at houses and we'd say, would you like some free bread? Would you like some free sweets? Of course, a lot of people would say no. But we were together after dark going around and giving out free food. This particular night, she lived right next door to Rachel's Refuge, which was the transitional house that my ministry ran for homeless women and kids in crisis that came out of the um, abuse shelter. And so I dropped her off. And I had my dog in my arm over here. She's leaning up, pumpkin. And I dropped her off. And all of a sudden, my truck just started going forward. Just moving forward. And I'm like, the door swings open. My dog falls out. I try to get my dog. I fall out. Now, I hurt my foot. And that night, before I walked out the door, this is what came to mind. You need to put on your sneakers. You need to put on your athletic shoes. I had on my Burks. My Burks were, like, cool. I liked them. They were comfortable. And it it was just that small. It was like, go change your shoes. I'm like, I'm not changing my shoes. I'm late. Do you hear me talking to the voice? I'm late. I'm not changing my shoes. I get there. If I had had those shoes on, guess what? I would have not hurt my ankle. So as I'm sitting, thinking about this, I said, (laughs) you told me, didn't you? And I didn't listen. And there was a consequence of that. He didn't disown me. He didn't discredit me. I had a big old place on my ankle for about six or eight weeks because I didn't go change my shoes. When you ask God, help tune my ears to you, then you need to start listening for the little bitty things because when you begin to teach your children how to obey, you start with little things, don't you? You don't go, okay, you need to go out and mow the yard. I know you're two, but go mow the yard. No, you say, put your toys up. You know, I don't know if two's too young, but some of y'all need to, you know, do something. Don't, you know, put, go put that in the trash or give that to mommy. Let me put, or, you know, you begin to train them with small things and they can't do it, but you do it over and over and over again. Kind of like that. Yes, ma'am. You know, in my house, it was like, yes. Uh, what was that? Yes, ma'am. No. We never said that. It was always, no, sir. I might forget the yes, ma'am, but I never get, no, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. What you do, sir? Over and over, it's a... And so I'm not saying that our walk with Jesus is something that you practice and then it comes, but it's something that you begin to practice with him, training your ear to listen. And see, he had to do that with the disciples. And as he, what he did with the disciples is he would look around to see what he saw around him. And then he would point that out and say, let me see if I can explain it to you this way. And he would go, look at the lilies of the field. They don't spin. They don't reap. But they're clothed in more splendor than all of Solomon's robes. And then what would they be doing? They would be looking at the lilies. And that image would come in their minds of what Jesus was talking about. Like, don't worry about what you're going to eat. That's what he's doing. So tonight, when we start chapter 21, he's trying to teach them something. And he's going to tell them coming up about some things that are to come. And these are not going to be wonderful, exciting things. They're going to be things that he's telling them, it's going to get rough. But I'm going to be with you. And I think that we, as believers, need to start living in the way where we really know things are tough. We don't, we don't say, you need to come to know Jesus 
and everything's going to be wonderful in your life. I, I've known Jesus a long time, and everything in my life isn't wonderful. But I know that there is someone I can go to. I can stop and go to the Holy Spirit and say, I am in a mess. You know, I, I don't know what to do. Like today, I'm at, I'm at the high school, and I'm looking for my, my textbook. It's, I've, I've had trouble with the AV equipment. It just won't work. I can't get it to work. So all of my teaching plans, I've got to on the fly. So I'm looking for the textbook that we need. It's not in my bag. It's not on the desk. It's not anywhere. I'm like, I know I put everything by the door. I put it in my briefcase, whatever. And I couldn't find, I, I, it just undid me, you know, because I knew I had my book. I needed my book to teach. I get home. I'm telling my sister about it. She came to visit and she was getting ready to leave. Well, she had a conference in Murfreesboro and, and stayed at the Coleman Hilton. And I said, you know, I was looking at my bag and there's that book we took everything out of my bag looking for that book so guess what someone took my book and then put my book back at the end of the class and I thought hmm okay you got me once you ain't get me again so you learn. You begin to learn. And you say, well, that's not really bad. Oh, yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was really bad. For 44 minutes, I'm like, okay, <laughs> let's talk about Sherlock Holmes. I don't have my book, but let me see what I can remember from it. Uh, hey, let me ask you some questions. What's the setting? <laughs> you start asking these questions. It was awful. It was just excruciating. But what you see is you begin to learn, and you say to people, you know what? The point is, is relationship with the God, with the living God, okay? So we have in chapter 21 of Luke, and Jesus is saying, he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a certain poor widow. Don't you love that? A certain, it, I love the cer a certain one, even though we don't get her name. A poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. What is he doing? He's got a little widow putting in her two cents worth, and they're putting in their treasure. And he says, I'm telling you that she put in more than all of those people. For they all out of their surplus or abundance. They all out of their abundance. You know, when I think about that, you just think, out of their abundance, they put it into the offering. They put it into to the, the treasury of the temple. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. We did this story. If any, any of you who went to vacation Bible school, we flannel board this story. We did this every way you could do it, didn't we? It's like Moses. We put popsicle sticks. We floated popsicle. You know, Moses, all of our sunk. None of our baskets floated for baby Moses. He would have died right there if he had been in our baskets for vacation Bible school. But, you know, here it says that she put in all she had to live on. I, I just don't know. Let me just... Put it up. Wow. All she had to live on. And she didn't have anybody going. I mean, Jesus, you know about this story? He doesn't go over and put his arm around her and say, baby, I saw what you did. And we're pleased, God and me. No. She put her money in. And she goes back to whatever that existence is where she didn't have money. Now, God had to provide for her somehow. Somehow. Because you don't know how much you need God until you don't have anything left. And that's where you say, oh, I really do need God. It might not be that we need money to eat. When we were in Malawi... They were drying those uh, sweet potato leaves as part of their vegetable for their night meal. And they were having to trust God where the next meal was going to come from, where she's going to feed three orphans and herself. And 
how does God provide? How he provides. You don't get a pink Cadillac necessarily. Um, but you get God's presence. And I've always, when it's the first time I realized that she didn't get any earthly you know, response from Jesus, I thought, oh my gosh, would I have done that? And what is it in my life that are my two last copper coins? That's my next question. What are your copper coins in your life? What are the, what's the thing that is the most important thing to you that you cannot let loose of to give to the Lord as a gift or as, as what you have? Some of us, it's our popularity. I don't know. Some of us, it might be our health. I mean, when I was sick, you know, all these seven years, I went through all that. I I was just like, look, if you're going to take me, take me now. I mean, I'm dying. Literally, I think. What are you doing? What what are you up to? Lord, if you just want me to, you know, raise my eyes to heaven and say, blessed be the name of the Lord, that that's what I'm going to be doing. Because what, what are the two precious copper coins that I'm holding back from the Lord? I saw uh, on uh, Facebook a, a, a family needed something. A little boy needed something. And she didn't ask for it on, on uh, anybody to help out. But it was, you know, it was a pretty, pretty big thing. They got like 18,000 children. And um, the Lord said, I, I want you to give them that amount. I w- actually, I want you to give them double that amount. I'm like, you got I mean, all they need is this much. He said, no, I want you to give double that amount. I'm like, I have learned now. I'm like, okie dokie. I couldn't wait to write that check, put it in the mail, send it to them, and say, may God bless you. Because I know in that family, they've put a lot of last copper coins in for a lot of things. They have given up a lot so Jesus would be alive in their family. And I, I just thought, I want to be that widow, but I'm afraid so often I'm the Pharisee putting in the bunch. And it's really not any big deal what I give to God. Miss Helen used to say, Rose, in the Old Testament, he demanded 10%, right? I said, well, yeah, I, I believe so. <laughs> well, in the New Testament, all of it is God. Not 10%, 100%. Like, oh, I never heard that preached. I mean, it's hard enough to wring 10% out of people. I don't know if you start preaching 100% what's going to happen. And this is the story she would tell. I worked at a, a place where juvenile delinquents went. Children under, under the age of 18 in the state of Alabama. I taught Sunday school there. Chalkful. And one night, I was at the grocery store, and I just had enough money to get the little bit of groceries I had, and my rent was due the next day, and I had $200 for my rent. And I ran into my, one of the former junior, juvenile delinquents. She just made me laugh all the time. I'm like, a former? It's kind of like the man formerly, you know, the old prost, you know, <laughs> the former juvenile delinquent. And he said, Miss Helen, it is so good to see you. I need you to pray for me. I've just moved into a place, and I need to pay rent. And I need $200 today to pay my rent. Would you pray? And Miss Helen said, yes. And the Lord said, give him your $200. She said, but my my rent is due tomorrow. I got to have that $200. She said, his rent is due today. She said, so Rose, I wrote him a check for $200, and I went and put something back (laughs) for the groceries and bought my groceries, and I drove home just to sing, and praise be to God how he's going to provide. I don't know how. I don't know what he's doing. So she gets to her mailbox. She opens it up, and there's a letter in there. And it says, we've been praying for a couple of weeks where to send this money, and God told us to send it to you. We don't know if you can use this $200, but here's $200 for you to use however you, 
if she hadn't given up her last $200, that $200 provision would not have had the magnitude of God saw her need before she even had it. And had someone praying prior to that moment of what they should do with this money, they heard and they sent. Oh, that we would be people who would listen to our living God. Verse 5, And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, I just think that's so funny, with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, Jesus said, As for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be torn down. Now let's, you go, and, you go home and you, you look at what artist renditions are of what the temple would look like and, and the, the magnificence of it and how much stone was there. And here's Jesus saying there's going to come a time that there's not going to be one stone on top of another. That means it's going to be totally destroyed. Verse 7, and they questioned him. I bet they did. Saying, teacher, when therefore will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, and this is our, the ver- it, to us. Take heed that you not be misled. For many will come in my name saying, I am he. And the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified. I, 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 can you not be I mean, if you just, all we have to do is look at the news today, and it's terrifying. I don't even have to go past the Senate and be terrified. I I mean, I don't have to listen to wars. Uh, Do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. And then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes, and in various places plagues and famines. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all of these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and the prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my sake. I think there would probably have been a mass exodus of disciples (laughs) I mean, first he's saying, you know, the world's going to blow up, but now let me talk straight to you. They're going to come get you. They're going to put you in prison. They're going to persecute you. They're going to lay their hands on you. You're not going to believe what it says in 13. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. (laughs) Can you see the guys? They're going to lay their hands on us. And they're going to put us in prison. And it's going to, they're going to kill. And it gives me an opportunity for my testimony. <laughs> I would just rather do that at Sunday night service. Can we do that instead of me doing all that kind of stuff? Can I give my testimony? No. What, th- this is earth shattering. God is, Jesus is saying, you know what? When you're in those bad places, guess what? That's the perfect time for you to tell people about Jesus. You, you've got to train your mind when you're in that place to start saying, that's what I want to say. Now, I'm just telling you, as a wounded person, the first time around, I wasn't able to do that. When you're wounded, when people do things to you, your natural response is, it hurts. You don't know what to do with it. Your mind seizes up. It's hard. It's difficult to know what to do. Then you go and you get counseling, or you go and you get on medicine, or you go and try to work it out. And then you begin to come to a place where you're stronger because of what you've been through. And your story is amazing. It is a story of overcoming. And you know what? I've overcome things in the world. So what's going to come next? Will it be hard? It might be impossible for me. But I have in my little bag remembrances of when God has delivered me before this time. What's that Ebenezer thing? Ebenezer stone? You put the stone down. Remember when I <laughs> We, we got to look at the Old Testament next semester. Because when they're going to go across the Jordan, 
And, 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 God, and God says to Moses, okay, tell the priests they're to put their feet into the water of the Jordan. And when they do, they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant. When they do, then it's going to part. But see, it's at flood stage. Have you seen some of these, these films that they've got on right now of, of, of rivers at flood stage? I mean, it is just like racing by. If you just put your toe in there, you're going to be swept downstream. But what Moses says to the guys, hey, guys, guess what God told me? He, he needs you to walk into the water of the Jordan up to your, your like ankles or knees and, and then he's going to part the water I ain't going first <laughs> no, let's turn this thing around and y'all go that way let's back into it, they're stronger, they're bigger no, you are to walk into the floodwaters to trust God, how about it yes sir yes sir and what happened the waters parted. And then God told him, he said, go take stones from the middle of the river on that dry part and go put them on the, in, the, in the promised land. And then you're going to take some from the promised land and put them in the middle of the river. And that scripture says, when the waters flew down, you know, came back over them, it said, to this very day, those stones are still at the bottom of that river. Evidence of God's marvelous provision. See, I think part of the problem in our lives is we don't keep up with how God has taken care of us. And we quickly forget. And so we're bitter and we're gripey and we're grumbly and, and we're hard to be around and we just fuss all the time. We're so, 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 all the time. And it's like, sweetheart, has God done nothing for you? For you to rejoice about? Well, yeah, but it's been so hard. Yeah, well, let's back up a little bit. Get back to the how he is, like, gives you breath. He lends you his breath. Sometimes we have to back it all the way up to, can you be thankful he lets you breathe? I've, I've done that to people. And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, well, that was a rounding, rounding thing there. An opportunity for you to share your testimony. Those days are here. Those days are here. 14. Look what he says to him. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. <laughs> you know, you're practicing the mirror. You're gonna, how are you going to defend yourself when they come? He's already telling them they're going to come get you. How are you going to defend yourself? That's my first response when I'm... How about you? You know, if there's some sort of danger or some, come, your first response is to defend yourself. Or they're like, you know what, you, 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 you. And you're like, no, no, you, you, you. You, know, you got the you, you, you thing going back and forth. He says, I, you just make up your mind. I love how he talks to him. Make up your mind. Not to prepare yourself what to say beforehand. Why? Verse 15. For I will give you utterance I will give you a mouth what did he give Moses a mouth how to, and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute my Bible says what does your version say same thing they're not going to be able to resist or refute see we're doing argumentative essays and I make my kids they're going to have to refute they're going to have to give refutation to what people might say against their argument. And the deal is, is that here Jesus is saying to these scared disciples, don't you boys worry, because I'm going to give you what to say. And when I give you what to say, they're going to be amazed. Can you trust me? <laughs> I don't think it's in there, but I, I bet he had that in his eyes. And you trust me, because they're like, they're regular people like you and me. They're not like supernatural. They're not the apostles yet. They're just the boys. I mean, it's pre-resurrection. They don't know what's going on. They just think this is a good ride. They're with this man who raises people from the dead and gives food when there's no food to be there. There's no 7-Eleven. There's no quick grip in the desert. There's no place to get a Twinkie. And somehow he takes five loaves and two fish and feeds more than 5,000 people and has leftovers for them to put in their basket. I think that's a good ride. But see, what he was doing is he was showing them who he was. Because one day, we're going to read it, it's going to come that it's going to get hard. 
what part of the five loaves and two fish have you put back in your basket? you got to have something that you can reach in when it gets hard and pull it out and go, yeah, it might be tough now, but I have seen his provision. God will provide. Remember the, the three Hebrew boys? We're not going to bow down to your idol. Our God can save us, but even if he does not, we will not bow down to your idol. They weren't being like insolent. They're just like, you're about to throw us in the furnace. Let's just give you the truth. Our God can, but he might not. Even if he does not, we're not going to do it your way. We've got to begin to think in the mindset that you're just not running around doing errands. You're not just running around doing what you think you're doing. You are on the path that God has put you on so that your testimony will be evidence of his presence in our world. I believe our churches are having a really hard time because we just come and sit and look and give and, and talk and fuss and, 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 and then go home and sit and look and fuss and fight and come back and sit and look and fuss and fight. We just have this, this bad habit or pattern where there's just no wonder. There's no place where we stop and go, I don't know how this is working, but it is, isn't it? <laughs> There's this kid in my class, he cannot write. He cannot remember. He really cannot keep from one week to the next how you put together an essay. And he's getting so discouraged. I have different people come over. I go to one of my guys and I'm like, maybe you can go over there because you're a guy and explain to him. I'm not, I don't seem to, would you be willing? So he goes over there and he's trying. He's giving his best shot. And as he's coming back over, I lift up my eyebrows at him like, how'd it go? And he's like, and so I say to him, you know what? You need to go to tutoring. I'll give you extra credit. Go to tutoring. Tell them what you don't. Let them see how you don't know how to do this process. By the end of the four hours, two or three times I'd gone over and looked at him and I said, I believe in you. I don't know how much we're going to be able to do by the time this is all over, but I believe in you. Don't lose heart. Don't lose hope. It's not over yet. And my prayer when I go home is, oh, God, please open his heart and his eyes and his mind so he can at least write an introductory paragraph with a thesis statement. Interesting how your prayers change with jobs. But see, that's my field. That's where God's put me. That's ripe with harvest. That's where I, I'm... That's where I'm to do what I do and show them that there's a living God. Look, verse 16 gets worse. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name. You don't get many people sign up for that kind of. Well, you are. You did. You signed up so he can get the... What have we seen in the stories? This is not because he sinned, but he's this way so God can get the glory. So God can get the glory. So men will see God's glory. So I will be glorified by this. So you will believe. So you will see. It's always got so... Blah, 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 blah. So you will see. Some of us forget to go to that little so and go to the other side. But it's going to get, get worse, he said. But verse 18, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your perseverance, you will win your souls. That doesn't mean that you are, are in charge of your own salvation. That's not what it means. When you give your life to God, he keeps it. You're in covenant. But I think sometimes my soul slips away when I forget that God's going to take care of me. However he chooses to do that. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. 
Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of the city depart, and let not those who are in the country enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. If you haven't underlined that, you need to underline 22. It says, that this has got to happen in order that all the things which are written may be fulfilled. You don't get out of that. We don't get out of what God has ordained so that his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. So sometimes when you're going through the worst of it, what do you need to do? You need to say, evidently I need to be here, so what? In order that all things which are written may be fulfilled, that God will get glory. And his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 23, woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time, times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. I, I've not been to Israel. Uh, I used to have a t-shirt. We made up, and a lady wore it, and she and her husband went to Jerusalem. And, and the gate where Jesus is supposed to come back in the second coming, she's standing there with her husband with my T-shirt on at the gate. I didn't get to go, but my T-shirt got to go to the gate where Jesus is coming in. But see, it's not, Jerusalem is not what it was. I mean, it's, it's not. Who, we have seen the desolation of Jerusalem, but there's going to be more. And here we, he talks about this is the return of Christ. They're not understanding this. He's got to give them the ability to understand it. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and upon the earth dismay among nations and perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. It's just been happening in North and South Carolina. Men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. You, you need to know that this is going to really happen. I mean, Jesus is going to really come in the clouds. We're going to see with our eyes. He's going to come. These are not myths. These are not stories. These are not something you pass down from somebody's you know, imagination. God himself said, Jesus is saying, the Son of Man is going to come. He's going to come in a cloud with power and great glory. See, it's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about the Lord. It's about the Son of God coming in great power and great glory. But when these things, verse 38, began to take place, I love this, straighten up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. What happens when you, you have this, when things are going hard, what do we do? We get bowed under and he says, when you see it, stand up straight, lift up your head. Because your redemption draweth nigh. Don't lose heart. See, even if we're approaching death, what we want to do to the people around us and say, don't fear. God is on the other side. Death is a door. I'm on this side. Jesus is with me. It opens. He walks with me through it. You're here. I'm there. Don't weep for me. One day we will all go there. I don't know what it's like. I can imagine, but... It's probably nothing like what I imagine, but it is where Jesus is. It is where the Lord is. It is where our people are who have gone before us. And in my family, that means all the dogs and cats. My mother's taking care of all the dogs and cats till we get there. <laughs> Another one goes, and we're like, Boo, go to Melrose. Missy, go to Melrose. <laughs> we're going, mother's going, Y'all better hurry up. We just laugh. I mean, you got to know that they're there. And, and now he's going to tell them a parable. <laughs> they're, they're probably so whatever. It's like, let me tell you a story. <laughs> they're like, yeah, I'm ready for a story. <clears throat> Behold the fig tree. Now we know there's a fig tree. What is he saying? Behold the fig tree. Look at the fig tree. Like, don't be looking down and don't be worrying. Look over here at the fig tree. And all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it, and know for yourselves that the summer is now near. 
Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on your guard that your hearts may not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. I love this. And the worries of life. I mean, we're all Baptists. We're like, I ain't that. I'm not drunk. Oh, worries of life. Wait a minute. Let me back up. Sometimes it's real easy to say, pass, not, hadn't done it. And my kids don't believe that I've not done drugs. They're like, oh, come on. You didn't, you mean you didn't inhale? I'm like, no, I didn't even draw it in. I didn't do it. I went to this seminar when I was in ninth grade, and I decided I'm not doing that stuff. I don't know why. Don't be wait. What does, it do? what does the worry of life do? It weighs you down. And that day come on you suddenly like a trap. It's a trap when we begin to worry and try to take care of our what's bothering us with food or with shopping or with liquor or with whatever it is, with sex or drugs or whatever we need, or just apathy. You know, sometimes I just have to stop and say, God, I, I, something is bothering me. Help me know what that is. It's because it's weighing me down. But keep alert. Keep, I like this, keep on the alert, verse 36, at all times praying in order that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. He's always telling us, look ahead to the goal. Pray that you'll have that. What do we need to be praying for our kids? We need to be alert. We need to be praying in order that they may have the strength to endure. I think that would be the hardest thing as a parent to know that your kids, grandkids, great-grandkids are going to endure great hardship. But guess what? It says there's a bowl in front of the throne, and it's the prayer bowl. And once the prayers get in there, they never leave. It is always before God. So when you pray according to the will of God, poop goes into the prayer bowl, and the Holy Spirit's always doing what God wants him to do, and he is fulfilling. He is all about answering the prayers according to the will of the Father. So when you pray for your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, when I pray for kids I didn't even birth, but they seem to be mine, I'm praying that they will find their way to the Savior. If there's something in me, some piece where it's like she doesn't give up. She, she keeps trying. She, she, you know, goes the extra mile. She, she, even when I had to say to the kid, he didn't have his work. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, our power went out last night, and I didn't know it didn't save. And I have a full-time job, and I can't work. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Just start. You have to recreate it now. Work on it right now. I don't know what to tell you, but you do the best you can. And he just got mad, and he just packed up his stuff and left. He would have been finished by the time 9 o'clock came around. But I didn't do the way he wanted me to do and to understand that his power went out. And I'm like, you know, I, I, this is the rule. We'll do the best we can. See, sometimes we just sull up with God, don't we? Because he didn't do it the way we wanted him to. Let me tell you, I, he hadn't done much of anything I wanted him to do. How about you? I mean, has life turned out like what you planned? No. I would have written it better than this. But then when I really look at it, I go, I couldn't have topped this. I wouldn't have been able to top this. I wouldn't be able to. Oh, my gosh. Shoot fire. It's amazing. Now, during the day, verse 37, Jesus was teaching in the temple. But at the evening, he would go out and spend the night on the Mount that is called Olivet. And all the people would get up early in the morning to come to him in the temple to listen to him. Now, after he's given the disciples this, here's what's coming, guys. Let's flip over to Acts chapter 4. You're not going to really see any words in red after John, after the Gospels. 
But you're going to see the result of Jesus' prayer over the guys and, and, and what happens through their lives. So Acts chapter 4, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, I think. Isn't that right? Acts. And I always am, am grateful when I see examples like, look at the fig tree. It's like that. Well, I'm like, okay, that's a fig tree. It's a tree. Okay, give me, you know, give me somebody with flesh on. That's one of the reasons I believe God brought Miss Helen into my life. Because I really didn't understand what it meant to walk with God and listen. And how you live every day till he brought this woman and said, watch her. Watch her. I wonder how many people God has brought into your life. And he said to them, watch her. That's how you live. That's how you'll know me. Watch her. And if we think, oh, man, I hope nobody's watching me, then we go, Lord, I lift up my life. May I be, may I be a person that you get to say to others, watch her because she trusts me no matter what. That only comes from God. That only comes from the Spirit. You cannot yoga your way to that kind of peace. I would be yoga in 28 hours a day and still not have what God gives. Not yoga is bad. I'm sure it's great. But it, it's something that comes from the inside out. Now, let's see an example of what happened after the resurrection and the Holy Spirit came. And the guys begin to walk out what Jesus said. I'll give you the words you need to say when they lay your ha their hands on you. Chapter 4, Acts 1. Oh, chapter 4, verse 1. And they were speaking to the people. Well, he's Paul. Peter's preaching his sermon. And they're speaking to the people, to the priest, to the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, the Sadducees, if I'm correct, they didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. So no wonder they were quite disturbed. <laughs> because they're like, hey, no, this, there's not one. And then you're, well, he, well, Jesus was raised from the dead. What, how's that working for you? Verse 3, my Bible says, and they laid hands on them. Did Jesus not tell them that they were going to lay hands on them? And it wasn't like for healing. They grabbed them. And put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the message believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. That's a good result. I mean, you, you would say that's a good result for being grabbed. But if you're being grabbed and you're beaten and, and it's a difficult time, you might have a hard time saying, yeah, but 5,000 people came to know God. Well, yeah, but my arm's broken. See, that's how you and I can help each other. We look in each other's eyes and go, yeah, but God is being glorified somehow, some way. Don't lose heart. You might be hurting, but he said he's going he's gonna to provide. Verse 5, and it came about on the next day that their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. That's a bunch of people. And Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. Acts chapter 4, verse 6. Now, they would not have come together if there hadn't have been a ruckus. If the boys hadn't have been thrown in jail. And so many had come to know the Lord. And all, all who were of high the whole kit and caboodle. I mean, Auburn and Alabama all showed up. I mean, the big deal. They were all there. And when they had placed them in the center, they put them in the center. Just imagine the pictures you've seen of the, you know, the Greek and the Roman, kind of like people sitting around, you know, and, and they put them in the middle. They began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Oh, verse 8, it's the big deal. Peter, comma, filled with the Holy Spirit, comma, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, 
If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. I think God's given them the word, don't you think? I don't believe Peter could have come up with this by himself. What does it say? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 11. He, Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. Oh, preach it, man. Just like it's easy. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. This is the crux, verse 13. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were marveling and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. It wasn't their education. It wasn't their training. It was the presence of God that came off of them in power that they were taken aback. Don't worry if you're not, you don't, you don't have schooling, that you're not trained. Whatever happened in your life, you don't worry about that. I want to be, and I know I'm not always that way, but oh, that we would say, oh, I want to be that person that it's obvious I've been with Jesus. Even if I'm untrained, uncouth, swear, drink, cuss, whatever it is, I have been with Jesus and he still loves me. And he's still working on me. That gives hope to everybody else. So we're not running around judging everybody and go, well, you're not, uh, you don't got it. Yeah, God's not going to let you go. You dip and chew and all no, he doesn't say anything about that in the Bible. Why were they so enamored with these men? Because it was obvious they had been with Jesus. Here's our next question for tonight. When people look at your life, who do they think you've been with? What are you, what, what's coming off of you? Meanness? Irritability? Anger? And you know what? We're not always of the Spirit. We, we don't always exhibit the Lord. But when he pricks our heart and we go, oh, I'm so sorry. Will you forgive me? Will you just let me start again and flow through me? He's like, yeah, baby. That's good. That's good because I want my kids, when they see me, as tired as I am, that I've been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. I mean, a man's healed. What can they say? Bunch of liars? No, well, that man's healed right there. What did Jesus say? When they lay hands on you, don't you prepare in advance what you're going to say. I'm going to give you what to say. Not only did he give them what to say, he gave them the Holy Spirit and an ability to heal so the glory of God would be shown in the midst of those people. Whatever happens to us, it's that so that the gospel will go forth. So that the gospel will go forth. So that people will know what the truth is. Not that you're able to buy the lake house. And it's wonderful. And all the family can gather. It is for the gospel. That doesn't mean you're not supposed to have a lake house. I'd love to come. Let's go skiing. Let's go fishing. I'd love to go fishing with you and Jerry sometime. But you know what? It's not that you get those stuff and you're not supposed to have it. But you give it to the Lord and say it's for the gospel. It's for the glory of God. What does that look like? Help us see it. We're never too old. Miss Helen, she's in the retirement home. She's in um, the, late, the, the highest level you go to, health care, where you know, you're really sick and about to die, and, and she couldn't sleep at night. <laughs> she would go down to the night nurses, and, and they'd go, here comes peanut butter and jelly, because she would do this peanut, peanut butter, jelly, jelly. It's the first time she ever did that for me, I'm like, 
<laughs> 70 something year old woman. Peanut, peanut butter, jelly, jelly. I mean, she's like putting herself into it. And she was known as the peanut butter and jelly lady. First, you take the peanuts and you grind them and you grind them. And then, whatever, I don't even know what it is. Then you put it in, and then you stick it in your mouth and you go, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> I mean, that's what she would do. She's almost 95. She's 95 years old. What is she doing at night for the night nurses? Peanut, peanut butter, jelly, jelly. Is she in pain? Oh, absolutely. Is she about to crawl out of her skin? Oh, absolutely. But God took her down there and said, I know how to do peanut butter and jelly. The presence of God, even through peanut butter and jelly. Verse 15, but when they had ordered them to go outside of the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem. And we can't deny it. Wouldn't that be amazing if something happened and they go, it's evident to all the people in Franklin. We can't deny it. But in order that it may not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to any man in this name. See, they're going to come say, you just keep your mouth shut. That'll do it. How are we going to cap? We got to cap this. Ah, it's too late. Guess what? Jesus is out of the tomb. He is out of the tomb. You can't cap it. You can't stop it. So what they do... They summoned them back in in verse 18, and they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. (laughs) I love this. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. You go, I don't know anything in the Bible. I'm not smart. I'm not... Can you talk about what you've seen and you've heard of the Lord? That's all you need. We can't stop talking about what we've seen and heard. Verse 21, And when they threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which they might punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. They were going to beat the fire out of them. And they're like, we can't. we got to release them because everybody's knowing what's going on. And if we beat them up, they're going to come out of here and they're going to go, what did y'all do to the men who just did the miracle? It hap- it, they, they beat up people as it goes on. It's not that that makes them stop. But in this moment, they didn't. Verse 22, for the man was more than 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. And when they had released, they had been released, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is thou who didst make the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, thy servant did say, Why did these Gentiles rage and the people devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, verse 27, in this city, there were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. Her. You need to unlearn that if you didn't. They're saying they are absolutely convinced that nothing happened that God did not ordain and predestined to happen. Verse 29, and now, Lord, take note of their threats. <laughs> you take note of their threats and grant that thy bond servants may speak thy word in all confidence. Why are they able to do this? Because Jesus promised them he would tell them what to do. He's given them the boldness. And they're saying, you do what you've asked, that we would speak with confidence. While thou dost extend thy hand to heal, and signs and wonders take place through the name of thy holy servant Jesus. There's a little caveat here. 
I think more healing is not going on because we, we're maybe taking a credit for it. But when someone's healed, I now know why Jesus said to the folks, don't tell anybody who did this. Just go on. Go on. And he brought glory to God. But when you and I pray that somebody be healed, it's kind of hard. We don't know if he's going to do it or not. It's like, don't remember my name. Remember the name of the Lord who healed you. It's about the gospel. It's about sharing the good news. So if we're healed or we're not healed, it's still about the gospel. But that's something I've been thinking about. Because it's like, I just didn't pray. Because it's like, well, I, you know, if he wants to heal him, you know, heal him. I, a little squeamish about it. But he says, you need to pray. You need to pray. I know people's days. I know how many days they're going to live. But you just pray for my spirit to come and do what it's to do for the gospel. That we would glorify God. Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Do you see that that's a direct answer to their prayer? They said, give us the confidence to speak. Well, he shook the whole building. And the Holy Spirit came down, filled up everybody, and they didn't have one iota of fear in that room. Why? Because they knew what they had seen and heard. Next question, what have you seen and heard of the Lord? What have you seen and heard? Ask him, help me remember, what have I seen and heard of you? If you don't have anything, ask him to wake you up so you can see and hear. Because he's all around us. Sometimes when I, oh, life is just so hard, I lift up my eyes and I see the clouds. And I'm just amazed. Like, how do you do that? I know there's like science and all that kind of stuff and the wind and the blah, blah, blah. Like, but wow, that one looks like a dog. That one looks like a, I'm not sure, but it's sure pretty. I mean, how do, I'm just, he takes my mind away and he gives me peace. I look, I raise my eyes to what he's created. And I'm like, you are amazing. This is crappy, but you are amazing. So when I look back down, I take with me the remembrance that God is amazing. Verse 32, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. How many believed over here in the first part? About 5,000. It came to be about 5,000. You know, there's always somebody to count, isn't there? Like, you know how many were there? No, I didn't even count. Well, he'll count. Every time he counts, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, all oh, about 5,000. I lost a couple times. I <laughs> kept moving around. About 5,000 5, people came to know the Lord. And what, now we know that the man being healed was a miracle. But look at what's the miracle in this verse. 32, and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. That's a miracle. And it cannot come by anything but our saying, Lord, come. You have your power. If you're going to put us in hard places, may we bear up and speak the name of Jesus well. In the middle of it, people say, how you doing? Oh, it's I'm in a hard place, but God's still God. He's still, he's still working. I don't know what he's doing, but he doesn't let me know often. <laughs> He actually doesn't ask me about anything, really. He just kind of does it. I, I kind of know things afterwards. But may I have that childlike heart to believe he really is going to do what he says. With this many people, there are more of us here than there were disciples. <laughs> Boom! I mean, what can happen in our world? Each one of you goes into a different world. You go into a whole different space. What if you realize it's not what you've done in the past. It's not stuff you're trying to fix or undo or redo. He says, just trust me. Confess your sins. Take, let me fill you with the Holy Spirit. Have confidence that as you move forward, 
I'm going to speak through you. I'm going to love through you. I'm going to be kind through you. Somebody wore a shirt the other day. It said something about, if you're going to be anything in this world, be kind or something. I can't remember. I can't remember things exactly. But I'm like, yeah, we can be kind. Sometimes just being kind in the midst of somebody not being nice to us. Thank you for cussing me out. God be with you. <laughs> I think sometimes for us just to not take it so seriously. Like, the battle is between the Lord and the enemy. And the enemy wants to use us to try to show God that we're not going to trust him. And I think, this is my final thing, I think that sometimes that when you just lift your eyes to the Lord and say, I just don't know how you're going to do it, but I just say, I believe, help my unbelief. And he gets to turn to the enemy and say, see, I told you, she doesn't love me just for what I give her. She loves me because I love her. And I think our God is able to have glory in our very weakest moments. When all we can do is lift our eyes. Even if we can't lift our eyes. If we're so far down in that ditch, we're eating dirt. Just say, Lord, I believe I'm going to believe. Just move the dirt around in your mouth. In your mind. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. That we would be men and women to walk forth in confidence because Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. The Holy Spirit has been sent here. That we have claimed him as our Savior. God has redeemed us through that. And it's not just a bunch of words to me. Atticus Finch in the movie for To Kill a Mockingbird, he goes to the, the jury and he says, you know, this is the place in America where all the... the all the land, all, all the ground supposed to be level. We know it wasn't true. But he said, this is just not an ideal to me. This is a living, breathing reality. Ladies and gentlemen, this has to be our living, breathing reality. Not an ideal, but the reality of your life. If nothing more than you say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that you came. Thank you that you told the guys, you told the people around you. We're going to see next week that the women who came out of Galilee, they were part of this crowd. They were part of the group. They were part of the ones who were following you and listening to you. And, and they believed. And we're part of the group. We, we want to believe as they did because we're not any better or worse than they are. It's all about you. May we know it's not about our training or our education or our status or what we have or don't have or how good our teeth look or, or don't or what we wear or how we carry ourselves or what we can afford. It doesn't have anything to do with that. And may those of us who bear the burden of those things of the past, may tonight we let you cut those ropes and let that weight fall away because it weighs us down. May we say, I give it to you. I wrap up my hurry and worry and bother. I wrap up those things that happened to me when I was a kid. I wrap up those things that have happened to me as an adult. I wrap them up and I put them in front of you. I put in front of you my diseases. I put in front of you my difficulties. I put in front of you and I give it to you and I take away your abundance. I don't know how that works out, but I'm just praying it's true. I pray that we will see that. And Lord, if you want to heal people, may we be... Bold enough just to believe you to pray over folks. We don't have to go lay hands on people, but sometimes you want us to go up and say, may I pray for you. I just want God to get glory, and if he wants to heal you, that you, you would be glorified. May we be men and women that if those are our two last copper pennies of what we don't, we're going to put in the, in, the, in the pot, that we would say it would be my embarrassment or my fear or my lack of confidence, but I'm going to give you that, and I have to see you provide. Thank you, Father, for each person here. I pray that you would be their light and life. I pray that you'd have bring salt into their world, that their life would have flavor again, that you would introduce them to what breathing means. For those of us who have trouble breathing and the difficulty, and we know that you give us our every breath, we're just grateful that you've given us the next one. I pray for this church. I pray it would be a city on the hill, that the gospel will go forth and that we would be known as people who have confidence in you and that you live in us. 
Thank you for the opportunity tonight to speak well of your name. And I ask all of this in the name of Jesus, believing that you've heard my prayer. Amen. Thank you for coming. Next week, we're going to be looking at one of my favorite things. I'm going to go off. Uh, <laughs> I just realized I was going to say I'm going to go off the line, but y'all know I do that all the time anyway. But we're going to look at uh, Luke 24. We're going to look at the women at the tomb. We're going to talk a little bit about that particular event. And Luke 8 is where those women are introduced. So Luke 8 is where they're introduced. They're the women from Galilee. They're a band. And then Luke 24. And it, it, the first part. We started with the road to Emmaus. And we're going to end with the first part of that chapter with the, the shiny men coming. The angels coming and talking to the ladies. So y'all have a good week. Thank you for coming.